In here, there's three of us, probably at one class. Okay, so a couple of things. A number of you contacted me regarding the grades on the critical thinking challenge from last week and apparently didn't understand why you got the grade that you got. The biggest thing that I saw for most of the groups was that it sounded like you each wrote a line and then just merged them together without having any sort of regard to voice and flow. And if uh, when I was in groups, we did the same thing where we would basically assign one party to do this part and one party to do that part. I think, um, you know, at least one team back here has encouraged everybody to write one sentence and then we'll put it all together. That's certainly an efficient way of doing it, but then you have to have one person, and this is what I usually did in my groups, was I was the one who would go through and make sure that the document sounded like it actually was one document with one voice so that you understood that it, you know, it, it sounded like it was one coherent thought. The other thing was that either there was no real thesis, it was a lot of interesting facts, but no real substantive theory that would tie it all together. So if you have questions about that, uh, I'll be happy to talk with you about them. One group sent me lots of text messages. It was rather difficult to answer all of the text messages. So you're welcome to call me uh, if you want. If you want a better grade, I will let you resubmit your group's paper with the comments that I've made in the Dropbox as uh, guidelines for what you should do and you can work on um, resubmitting that. I'll let you resubmit that one time. See, even though I'm a Jew, I'm showing Christian love and mercy. <laughs> Uh, if we look at the syllabus or the course outline, I know we probably all haven't looked at the syllabus for some time now because, you know, it's one of those things that you get and you don't look at. If you look at the syllabus, we're supposed to have an exam, which I have right here today. And then on Thursday, why is this not working? Come on. There we go. All right. So we're supposed to talk about, finish talking about corporate social responsibility, which we'll do today, which rounds out the first three chapters, and then we have the first exam. I have taken the exam myself. I made 100 on it, so it's fair and balanced, just like Fox News. We're going to be rest assured that it's, uh, it's all, you know, perfectly on the up and up. There are a objective portion which consists of 25 questions which I want you to put on a green scantron form 882E. If you do not put it on a green scantron form 882E, it will not be graded and you will not get credit for that portion of the exam. The essay portion of the exam I have created and I'll show you just a second in Dropbox for you to drop that into. And so I want you to bring the Scantron a week from today and have your essay portion dropped in the Dropbox by midnight on Tuesday night a week from today, which will be uh, October 11th, I believe, if I've got the dates right. So the first exam is today. I'll give this to you as a take-home exam. And then on Thursday, you can either work in your groups, so we will not meet. You can either come in here, I'll open the door, and you can work in your groups, or you can have Thursday to work on the exam or you can have it to work on your individual article reviews, which are also due um, next week. So the first article or the one article review will be due next week, and we'll start talking about those on Tuesday. So you have that day to either work on the exam or your article reviews or your group projects. Isn't that nice of me, yes. like the last time? Having said that, what I expect in the essay exam, I, a lot of you will come up with one paragraph. This is. The hypothetical here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven paragraphs. You really need to develop an essay. If you're doing anything less than three or four pages, type double space on the essay, you're probably not going to get a really good grade. One paragraph is not going to cut it. Uh, you're supposed to make an ethical decision, but there are all kinds of considerations in this fact pattern that you need to think of. 
you need to think beyond just the facts that are given in the fact pattern to how your decision will impact all of the stakeholders in this hypothetical. So even though customers are not mentioned in the hypothetical, you have to think about how this will impact customers, how this will impact communities that the hypothetical is set in, what kind of impacts you'll have on the environment. So we'll talk about corporate social responsibility today along with marketing theory and that integration of those theories with analysis on the impact of stakeholders is going to be critical for getting a really good grade on this, on this exam. If you come up with one paragraph, if you come up with, I would say a five paragraph essay would be a C. You know, sort of standard five paragraph thesis statement based on the utilitarian principle I have decided to do X. Here are the three factors. That's going to be about a C. Every semester I have students who say, I really didn't understand what he wanted in the first exam and I, I don't know how I can be any clearer on this than to say that I, I actually am going to grade essays at a 4,000 level like a 4,000 level should be graded. Now, having said that, every semester I start out with that and then I start to read and then I begin to cry and I then start to drink and I, I become somewhat more charitable uh, after you know I hit the crown a couple of shots. Um, but still, there's a, a limit to the amount of charity that I can I can uh, can express if you have one paragraph. And That's every semester, you turn in one paragraph. What? That's because you're drinking Canadian whiskey. If I was drinking bourbon whiskey, if I, okay, I'll I'll, I'll try the the Evans so this time instead. <laughs> so I you know just be forewarned. Um, and and so there won't be, I'm letting you redo the critical thinking if your group wants to and turn that in by next Tuesday, uh, there won't be no takesy backsies on the exam. <laughs> so, you know, you get one shot at the apple, not, you know, uh, do-overs, no mulligans on the exam, particularly since it's take home. Any questions about that? So you're all, yes? Can you repeat the time? So the essay's due and the dropbox at midnight on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. And then this would bring you class. Bring class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I suppose that I suppose if you could figure out a way to get it to me by midnight so that I can grade it, but it will not go through a Scantron machine if you take a picture of it and fax it to me. Okay. And if I have to hand grade it, I, I will be highly upset and distraught and probably not a very good I, I'm inherently lazy. That's why I took this job. Same. You know, because I, I didn't want. To, I was a corporate vice president. I made a lot more money as a corporate vice president than I do as a college professor. But I had no time to spend that money, and so I, I'm inherently lazy. And as, as much work as I can offload to automation and scantrons are ancient automation by this point in time, I attempt to do that because I don't want to, to work that hard. UCO doesn't pay me enough to work that long. Uh, yeah. The article review, is there a Dropbox for that? Or there is a Dropbox for that. I, in fact, I think <coughs> see if I made that just to make sure. Is there? I didn't make a Dropbox, so I'll tell you what, while I'm thinking about it right now, I will make the Dropbox so that you can put it in the Dropbox. The item, generic. The Dropbox is for both the article and the essay. Oh, yep, there's the article review. So it should be there. There it is. Is that due by 11? Yeah, but we'll start talking about it on Tuesday, so you better be prepared to talk about it. So I'll just randomly, well, I'll randomly ask people. So, you'll be expected to appear alert and chirpy with regard to your article and be able to provide some kind of insight. Any questions about that? No? 
know. All right. So today we need to talk about marketing philosophy. I think it's a good integration of theories here when we get to corporate social responsibility and the marketing theories. For those of you who didn't have me for principles, I'm sure a, an inferior scholar did a very piss poor job of lecturing you on the marketing theories. So when we talk about theories, there are sort of kind of broad range, overarching, grand theories of the universe, that would be Plato's Republic. It answers all three of these questions. What is the question of knowledge? What is it I can know? How can I know it? What is the question of governance? What is the right society to live in? And what is the, uh, what is the, the good life, the question of conduct? Then there are sort of mid-range theories which answer spe discipline-specific problems in marketing we have progressed through a series of four philosophies, and I think this progression ties in well with the development, at least in the last part, of corporate social responsibility. So what are the marketing theories that we can talk about? Well, there's the production philosophy, and it corresponds to uh, various eras. So we say that these philosophies held sway for various epochs in time. Now, as we go through these, it's important to remember that there are companies that still use older theories and are successful employing those older theories based on maybe an environmental scan of the market that they exist in or the competitive environment. So these are the four theories. There's the production philosophy, the sales philosophy, the marketing philosophy, and finally the relationship philosophy. And I think the relationship philosophy ties in very well with this idea of corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility itself is not without controversy. It sounds good, and we all think that businesses should be friendly, but economists like Milton Friedman would argue that businesses have no other ethical responsibility than the maximization of shareholder wealth, and that a business that engages in anything other than maximization of shareholder wealth is stealing from the shareholders and is immoral. Now, I think that with all due respect to Dr. Friedman, he's absolutely 100% a priori wrong on that position because corporations enjoy, enjoy enormous advantages that are conferred on them by society. And for every right that you have, you also have certain responsibilities. So tonight, for example, an attempt to be responsible citizens, I'm going to encourage you. There is a huge political marketing event that is taking place on television. What is it? Vice, president. Vice, vice presidential debates. And I would encourage you all, as good citizens, to watch the vice presidential debates. A, because it's political marketing, which is an aspect of marketing that we don't normally talk about in business schools because we're mostly focused on business. But it is marketing. These two people are going to try and sell their platforms. And although historically vice presidential candidates have been an afterthought and not been a very big influencing factor on voter decision, maybe it should be. Because as Vice President Biden has pointed out numerous times, there is a guy who follows him around with the exact same thing that the president has followed around uh, with, and that's called the nuclear football. And it is the case that contains the launch codes for our nuclear armaments. And the vice president is a heartbeat away from the presidency, and on several occasions we have had vice presidents that have been elevated through death or assassination, or through both death, uh, and one through the resignation of the president, have risen to the, the position of the president. So this is an enormously important person. I think you should watch the vice presidential debate because this person could be the next president of the United States if the president doesn't make it. I do think that in the election between John McCain and Barack Obama when he ran the first time, I think that the vice presidency did play a bigger role because Sarah Palin was clearly the dumbest person on the planet. Um, and we'd had four or eight years of the second dumbest person on the planet running the country, and I think people did recognize that. So it's important. I think you should watch it. 
You should watch the debates. And the reason I bring this up and bring up government is because as a society, we've decided, our government has decided, that business is a good thing. And so we confer enormous benefits to business through the corporate structure. And what's the biggest benefit that we confer through the corporate structure? What's the biggest reason that people go and form a corporation? Is it profit? It's what? Taxes. You might argue that taxes are a disadvantage of the corporate form. It's what? It's, un, it's limited liability. If you have a, a DBA, so there are various ways that you can start a business. You can go out and you can hang a shingle. I can decide that I don't want to teach here at UCO anymore and I can go start a law office, right? I can hang out a shingle in a building in downtown Guthrie that says Aguirre uh, Law Office and that's a DBA. Now, as a DBA, I enjoy all of the profit that I make. It's simplistic from a tax perspective because all of the profit that I make is simply what? It's personal income tax, right? It's taxable income. But what do I have? If somebody trips and falls on the doormat entering my law office, I have unlimited liability. They can sue me for the trip and fall and take everything I own, with certain exceptions. There are what we call the homestead exemptions that are allowed for in Oklahoma. So what things, Oklahoma is actually a, a really generous state in terms of the personal exemptions. What are things that people can't take away from you? But yeah, you can't take my books. Uh, the tools of the trade, we don't let you attach that. Those could be valuable. Law libraries are valuable, but nobody has them anymore because it's all online. What else can you take in Oklahoma? We have one of the biggest exemptions in the nation. We have an unlimited homestead exemption, so you cannot attach to a person's home. So even if you sue them and you get a million dollar judgment, you can't attach that judgment to their home. They're totally free and clear from that, but based on the homestead exemption. The only exception to that would be a mechanics lien. If somebody actually works on the home, then they can attach a lien to it. But for any other kinds of cause of action, except a mortgage, they can't attach to it. The next most simple form of business organization is a what? It's a partnership. Now, what you're hoping to get in a partnership is a synergy between the partners. Two people can do more work than one person. So if I, for example, my field of expertise in the law is intellectual property. So I did, when I was a practicing attorney in private practice, I did copyright, patent, and trademark. That's what my practice was limited to. Now let's suppose I want to have somebody who knows something about SEC filings and mergers and acquisitions. I could take on a partner and we could be a corporate boutique firm that, for, that focuses on mergers and acquisitions <coughs> and uh, intellectual property rights, copyright, tra trademark, and patent. And that would be good because he has expertise in that area and I have expertise in this area and together we can maybe increase our return on investment for businesses that we solicit to come into our law firm. The bad part about a partnership is that I'm not only liable for my own liabilities, I'm now what? I'm now liable for that partner as well. So if I get sued for malpractice, let's suppose he doesn't file the 10K or 10Q in a timely manner and it costs my company or it costs one of our clients lots of money, uh, we can both have unlimited liability. Then you get to the limited liability form, and traditionally, and there are various versions of this now, it's the corporate form. Now, in the modern era, we have come up with LLPs, limited liability partnerships, LLCs, limited liability companies, and then the traditional corporate form. Now, the disadvantage of the corporate form is that it's double taxed, because the corporation 
as you all might remember in the last presidential election, Mitt Romney was wrongly criticized for saying, corporations are people, my friend. And everybody knows corporations are not people. Well, actually they are. They are legal people, which means that they can do what? They can what? They are double taxed. So they are a legal person, so they have to file corporate income tax, just like an individual, which means that any dividends that pass to the shareholders may also be taxed, although passive income is taxed at a lower level than uh, active income, which I've never understood in the tax code, why we penalize people who actually work hard for their money and give a big break to people who rely, like Mitt Romney, who rely on passive taxing, passive income. Um, the corporation is taxed, but it also can own property in its own right. It can sue and be sued in its own right. So if I have a law office and I have a limited liability partnership, which is a quasi-corporate form, and somebody trips and falls, I am only liable to what? <coughs> to the investment that I put into that law. <coughs> so uh, only the assets of the, the partnership or the limited liability entity can be could be attached. Historically, that was the corporate form. And the reason I point all this out is because I think we confer an enormous advantage to corporations by this limited liability. And as a result, because of that right and that advantage, I think they also have certain responsibilities to act in an ethical manner. And so I would disagree with Dr. Friedman that corporations only only legitimate purposes to make money. It's not. I think that they have an obligation. If we are going to confer an advantage on you, which says that your liability is limited, and with lots of corporations, that means that if somebody is injured by their product or service, what is that individual going to get? We have lots of people that form corporations. The vast majority of companies in this country are not GM. They're not Ford Motor. They're not Trump Enterprises. They are mom and pop organizations that have chosen to take advantage of the limited liability. And so what does that mean if you sue them? If you have a restaurant, for example, if I have a restaurant chain, what's a local restaurant chain here in Oklahoma that's largely not found outside of the great and sovereign state of Oklahoma? Can you think of a local restaurant? All American Pizza. All American Pizza. I don't know what All American Pizza is, but I'll take it's your word for there's it. Only there's, there's, there's only 11 of them. There's only 11 of them. I'll take your word for it. That it's only in Oklahoma. Somebody said Brahms. Yes, Brahms started in Oklahoma. They have branched. They have branched out to a few other states, but they will not go further than they can deliver because they are a vertically integrated company. They produce all of their own product for at least the ice cream and dairy part of their stores, and so they won't go beyond what they can actually service with their plants in Oklahoma, their cattle operation in Oklahoma. So they're a wholly owned, locally kind of operated store. Hideaway Pizza is another one that started in Stillwater and it's fairly regionally located. Hal Smith Group is another one that's an Oklahoma company. What is Hal Smith? Um, Charleston. They own Charleston's, which is the local. What? Upper Crust. They own Upper Crust, okay, what else? They, they've had to rebrand one of their properties. KD's. Yeah, they, they closed KD's because decided that he was not going to stick with the Oklahoma team and he left and so they're having to rebrand it. I wonder, you know, if they'll, uh, RWs? No, they're going to They're going to call them Legacy. Okay. So that, that's a Hal Smith property. Let's suppose you get food poisoning at one of their restaurants. What are the chances, you know, you die? It's easy to die of food poisoning. Let's say you get something really, really bad. Oh, I don't know, like E. coli. <laughs> what are the chances that you're going to be able to recover you know, millions and millions of dollars from Hal Smith? I don't know. What are, what are their assets? A lot of restaurants. Probably not much, because I'd be willing to bet that all their restaurants are what? Leased. Do you think they own the properties? Probably not. There's a, reason, there's a tax reason why you don't own property if you're a business. What's that? You buy the property yourself, what do you have to do? Property tax? No, you're going to have to pay property tax one way or another. I mean, the, the landlord is going to pass on the cost of the property tax to the tenant. So you're going to pay it one way or another. But you have to depreciate the value of the property out. And if it's a lease, you can do what? It's a 100% deduction. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that probably, let's suppose that you're a big time lawyer at McAfee Taft making several million dollars a year, and you go to Legacy or Legends or whatever they're going to call Katie's now, you get E. coli, which is a bad bacteria because some cook forgot to wash their hands after they visited the facilities and you die. How likely is your widow going to be to claim you know, a whole lot of money? Well, maybe not much, because there may not be much there to get. And so that's a huge advantage, isn't it? That you don't experience personal liability. They can't come and take away your own personal wealth. And so I think you have an obligation with that huge advantage to engage in socially responsible activities. So the production philosophy existed through most of history, through most of recorded history we can find the production philosophy up until about 1920. What is indicative of the production philosophy? Well, there are a few producers of goods. Most goods and services were provided locally. For the vast majority of human history, people lived where? On the farm. How was Oklahoma settled? We were, we were settled in a land run. The unassigned lands were settled in a land run, which took place on April 22, 1889. Where was the land office located? Guthrie, it was located in Guthrie, so you filed your claim in Guthrie, America, which became our territorial capital. So Guthrie, America uh, was the, the territorial capital. They, they settled Oklahoma, or the unassigned lands, in one day through a land run on April 22nd, 1889. They lined up on the 32nd parallel, a cannon was fired, and people ran from the land. And they came here and they staked out their claim and they lived on the land, they produced wheat or you know, something else, farm, uh, agricultural products, <coughs> pigs, pork, cattle, dairy, things like that. And you, if you had a dairy farm, you did what? You took your milk to town and you sold it. And if you had pork, you slaughtered pigs and you took your pork to town and you sold it in the farmer's market. And gee, wasn't that great. You knew who the producer was, things were simpler. You went to town in your buckboard wagon. How did they run? How did the vast majority of people run in 1889 to stake their claim? On horseback. Which is the reason why we have 77 counties in Oklahoma. What was the logic behind having 77 counties? So you're getting a history lesson as well. Isn't that, that's the value added part of this course. That's the value added proposition. Why did we have 77 counties in Oklahoma? How many of you are Oklahoma natives, graduated from an Oklahoma high school? So you all had to have Oklahoma history. So you should remember this. That lady was spiteful. Well, you're asking me to go back to 1989. That lady was just spiteful. The, your, your history teacher was spiteful lady. Spiteful. spiteful lady. She hated everyone and everything. I'm convinced. She I remember the big book. The big book? Yeah. <laughs> Which was the big book? I mean, you just made a book of the state of Oklahoma and went through the history of it, like from the land run on. Uh, it's really just too depressing, honestly. <laughs> we have just some depressing history throughout, so I just stopped paying attention. Trail of tears. Wow. It's just a little depressing. I mean, I don't remember graduating from an Oklahoma high school. You had to, it, it's a requirement. I don't, there are lots of things that the legislature requires, and one of them is Oklahoma. If you graduate from a Texas high school, the Texas legislature requires, among other things that you know about Texas history, the Texas legislature also mandates that they teach in public school kindness to birds in the nest. What? It's a state law. Really, it is. Isn't that great? Kindness to birds in the nest. <coughs> Right. Seems important. Don't don't kill those quail that are in the nest. Kill their mother, you know, or whatever. But don't, don't kill those baby quail that are, that are on the ground there. We have 77 counties because they didn't want the county seat because you had to do business at the county seat 
to be more than half a day's ride from any place in the county. And so we have all these little tiny counties. New Mexico, which is the larger state geographically than Oklahoma, has far fewer counties because they didn't care if you had to ride further than, than a day's ride to get to the county seat. That's why we have 77 counties in Oklahoma. So you go to the county seat, you go to the farmer's market, you would trade your goods. There were very few producers. There was little product differentiation. You wanted milk for your cereal or whatever. Milk is a staple. You got what? Back in 1889. You got full milk, non-homogenized. What does homogenization do to the milk? Unpasteurized, non-homogenized milk. So what is what is non-homogenized milk? What makes it homogenized? I drink bronze milk because it tastes great. I have no idea what the homogenization has anything. Homogenization is the fat content throughout the, it's, a, it's an equalization of the fat content throughout the milk. So if you have 2% milk, you have what? 2% fat. 2% fat throughout, the, throughout the, the milk. The pasteurization process ensures that it's what? Bacteria. Probably not harmful for you to drink. But in the good old days in 1889, you could go buy milk from the dairy, and it may or may not, probably wasn't homogenized with the milk that you got a lot of fat. In the milk, it wasn't necessarily the same consistency throughout. We've now totally differentiated this product. With just regard to cow's milk, how many different kinds of milk do we have today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that mean for whole milk? Whole milk has 4% fat throughout. I think it's 4%. Don't 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 quote me. I may be wrong. Right. Maybe it's not all fat. No. No, if it's all fat, it's what? 100%. It's heavy cream. <laughs> so heavy cream is what you want to create the, the full fat. <coughs> you could also take the heavy cream and make it into, somebody said, butter. butter. How many of you have made homemade? You can, do, you can get on YouTube. There's videos now <laughs> on how to make butter. Next, next time I have time for that, I will. You're not, you're not interested in doing that? It's not that. I just don't have the time to sit down and make my own butter. It, it's, it's really good. It's highly fascinating. It's really <laughs> so, just with regard to milk, this is an example of the production philosophy. You went to the, the dairy, you got your milk, or they, they brought it to town to the farmer's market and sold milk. What kinds of milk do we have now today? How is, how is it differentiated today? You've got what? You got vitamin D, whole milk, skim milk, two percent milk, one percent milk. What else do you have? You have fat-free milk, which is skim milk. You can get chocolate milk now that's pre-made already. That's not cow milk. I'm just trying to talk about differentiation. Is that all the milk? Oh, if you uh, if you want to expand out the differentiation, we've now got non cow milk milk, we've got almond milk, we've got soy milk. There's lactose-free milk. There's lactose-free milk. Most people are slightly lactose intolerant, and so they now make, for those people who want to drink cow milk instead of almond milk or soy milk, maybe because you have a nut allergy, and so you still want milk, but you're also lactose intolerant, we've now removed the lactose Just from the milk. From milk. <laughs> By the way, Humans are the only animal that naturally, or not naturally, we don't naturally do it, but we're the only animal that continues to drink milk after the weaning. Almost all other mammals are lactose intolerant after the weaning. And so humans are the only ones that continue to drink milk. Why is it that we probably started drinking milk? And by the way, you're less likely to be lactose intolerant the more northern European you are. Less that's, that's weird. That's weird. Huh? That explains why I'm not tolerant. You're not Northern European? The Northern Europeans, what's a wonderful way of turning milk into good protein? Cheese. Cheese. If you live in Northern Europe, you have far fewer other agricultural commodities that you can store for long periods of time. And cheese is a good one. So they tend to be slightly less lactose intolerant. But almost all human beings are slightly lactose intolerant, which is why if you have two or three glasses of milk, you'll probably get a stomach ache probably have a slight stomach ache. I get really sick, and I love milk. So, you know, lactose-free milk. There wasn't any of this back in 1889. There wasn't even lactose-free milk until the last 10 years when they developed a system for um, removing the lactose from the milk. So few producers, little product differentiation. Products were not sophisticated. 
at this period of time. They were pretty well handmade, or if they were manufactured, it was simple manufacturing processes that, that allowed uh, them to be made, manufactured, and sold. Some of the first mechanical processes were, of course, agricultural products. The cotton gin was one of the first ones to be manufactured that, and sold. Um, a reaper that was a mechanical reaper that allowed you to harvest grain was one that was an early patent. So, but there wasn't a whole lot. This era can be summed up by a phrase from a movie called The Field of Dreams, and what is the takeaway from The Field of Dreams? If you build it, they will come. That's the takeaway from the production era. If you build it, they will come. If I manufactured almost anything, somebody would buy it. Or if I produced almost anything, somebody would buy it. Because there was a need for it. There wasn't a lot out there. You went to the general store and there wasn't a whole lot of stuff. Most stuff you made um, at home if you, if, you, uh, if you needed it. So people were very thrifty. My Grandmother grew up on a farm in Kentucky, and she can remember her mother making summer dresses for them. There were 12 children in their family, and her mother made summer dresses. People would buy huge sacks of flour, and the flour sacks had patterns on them, and they would make summer dresses for them out of the flour sacks. So you, you produced a lot of this stuff on your own. If you build it, they will come. The Ford Model T. You could get the Model T in any color you wanted, so long as that color was yeah. In the Industrial Revolution, starting in really the 1920s, when we really, really industrialized, the Industrial Revolution begins at the beginning of the 20th century, but it really ramps up in the teens and 20s. We get a lot more producers entering the market. So what happens with the car market? We start out with the first mass-produced automobile is Henry Ford's Model T, then who else enters the market? They realize that you can make money Chrysler. by mass producing this. Yeah, you get Chrysler, you get the Dodge brothers that enter the market and start making different models of cars. So there were very few differences in the Model T. There were some options that you could get on it, but not very many. You certainly couldn't get it in any color. In the 1920s, we start seeing more producers enter the marketplace, and you get industrialization, and you get more product differentiation. And this is also the era of transactional sales. So what we have is you have to now hire salespeople to go out and try and sell your product. More and more. As you have more competition in the market. And really the sales era is exemplified by the ADA model of marketing, which stands for awareness, interest, desire, and action. And so what you would do is we talk about a pyramidal structure. There's make a pitch, right? Um, get attention, awareness. And then most of your time is spent closing and moving on to the next sale. This is the era in which we get sort of the pejorative view of salesmen. There were all <coughs> kinds of salesmen they were hired for all kinds of businesses and they traveled around the country selling all kinds of stuff. Most stuff was sold door to door by these people. There are still remnants of this today. Historically, if you wanted to buy an Electrolux vacuum cleaner, they sold those door to door. The door to door salesman would go and sell you Electrolux vacuum cleaners. Rainbow is still sold door to door. My mom loves her rainbow. She loves a rainbow. Yeah. It's a vacuum. Yeah. What's the rainbow's claim to fame? They're about a thousand bucks still. It's got a water filtration. It's got a water water system, so you catch all of the dirt, it doesn't go flying back out, and then you just pour it down the drain or you take it out and dump it. And it's a lot cleaner than the bag, which if you take the bag off of vacuum cleaner, what happens inevitably is the dust goes everywhere. If you take that canister thing off the thing, if you have a bag if you have a bagless canister, if you don't take it outside again, what happens to all the dust and allergens that you trap? Well, it's like the rainbow, it's in a water thing. And they make product that goes in the rainbow to make the water smell good so that as it is blowing air out, it's freshening the air in the room. My grandmother had this horrible cough, and her doctor suggested she get a rainbow to vacuum everything to get rid of all the mold and stuff in her house and shit like that. 
wasn't that. So then he said, well, maybe you've got a pet allergy, get rid of your bird. She got rid of her bird. That, that didn't do it. So they said, we'll have all your vents cleaned out. She had to come out and suck out all the vents in her house. She went to another doctor and he said, did, did he put you on a new blood pressure bed? And she said, yep. They took her off the blood pressure bed and put her on the old bed and the cough went away. So she spent $1,000, got rid of her bird, and you know, had the house cleaned for you know, a blood pressure. <laughs> she came out of a really clean house, a new doctor. She did, call. absolutely. <laughs> You know, so if this is the transactional sales model. This is what you see at the state fair, them making their pitch, getting a, a, an interest. One of the ones that I saw years and years ago that was really a great one was this guy was selling, it was basically the Sham Wow when they first came out. And he was making this pitch about, you know, this chamois, synthetic chamois product. And he had two guys that would, you know, come up and, you know, they were 20 bucks and they would, act interested and they give them 20 bucks to get the chamois and then 15 minutes later they were same two guys were back again you know saying he made lots of sales i think this is the era in which we get this this negative opinion of salespeople from this pejorative idea of of the sales uh profession because it really was just about making the sale and moving on. The idea was there's lots of people out there, we're still producing for a basically homogenous society, and you just need to make your sale, get the money, and move on because there are more people. It's not what we teach today. Today what we teach is an inverted pyramid style of sales, which is focusing on relationship. So the vast majority of time is spent building a rapport and gaining confidence, finding out needs, and, and then uh, very little time is actually spent uh, in closing. So the sales philosophy. During this period of time, we did colossal damage to our environment as a result of industrialization, and people didn't realize all of the negative impacts that it would have on our environment. People didn't know about things like acid rain, which were produced by soot from textile mills and factories in the Northeast, coal production facilities. And we did an enormous amount to deforest our country, um, ruin a lot of rivers and streams, but it's one of those areas where as a result of recognition of the environmental impacts that businesses have, we have really turned a lot of that around. There were lakes in the Northeast that were so polluted and so full of acid that nothing would live in them that had actually come back. One of the Great Lakes, I think Lake Superior at one time was, was suffering from huge population loss in their fish, and as a result of recognition of the environmental impact that businesses have, we've managed to limit um, the externalities that have occurred as a result of industrialization and made things much more safe. In the 1960s, we get marketing, the marketing era, and this is the era in which we really see marketing science take hold. A recognition that you could actually use scientific study of human behavior to predict what it was that people needed and wanted. So we have even more producers than we had in the 1920s in the sales era entering the market. And companies really have to focus on product differentiation. And so it's studying the consumer and figuring out what they want using focus groups. How many of you like a television show called Mad Men. Nobody watched you all are marketers and you didn't like Mad Men. I, it. I love Mad Men. It was about the advertising industry and in several episodes of Mad Men they showed focus groups that they had with people. So it was actually watching consumers and seeing how they use products, what they were using, what kinds of products they wanted. We have more producers, more products, more technical sophistication, and higher levels of product differentiation we're able to study people from a more scientific perspective. So there are two foundational disciplines of marketing. What are the two foundational disciplines of marketing? So marketing is a discipline that's sort of borrowed from a lot of other disciplines, but there were two primary that sort of started the marketing um, academic movement. Psychology is one, consumer behavior, and the other is economics, really focusing on logistics studies. So the first economists, uh, the first marketing department sprung out uh, from agricultural <coughs> economics departments. 
So the big names in marketing are actually not at what you might think of as being the Ivy League. You have a lot of agricultural schools that were some of, some of the ones that were on the forefront of marketing. And to this day, the biggest name in marketing theory is a guy named Shelby Hunt, who's not at a big name school that you think of as being a big name school in terms of like the Ivy League, which would be Harvard, Princeton, Yale, um, those kinds of places. He's at Texas Tech in Lubbock. He's the preeminent scholar in marketing theory. So you see a lot of those developing at agricultural schools. The University of Wisconsin focusing on how you get products to consumers in the most efficient manner uh, available. And so it's a combination of logistics studies and scientific just-in-time inventory control things and consumer behavior. We've now gone beyond just the study into what we call the relationship philosophy or the era of value co-creation. So there's a focus on customer lifetime value. There's a recognition now that it's easier to keep a customer than it is to go out and prospect <coughs> for new customers. <coughs> Prospecting and getting people to buy your product is expensive. Advertising is expensive. Even in an age as sophisticated as we are where ads are now popping up, how many of you play Angry Birds? Nobody plays Angry Birds in here? How many of you play games on your phone, some kind of game? How many of those games are free? Lots of those games are free because what do they do with the game? Make it impossible to beat without paying something inside of it. Okay, well they do that, but what else do they do with the games for a lot of the free games? They do ads. So if you want to increase your stuff you watch an ad, um, for example, one of the ones that I play, Rodeo Stampede, that my nephew put on this phone that I'm absolutely addicted to, they advertise a lot for other games that they produce, like Mobile Strike Force, which has got Arnold Schwarzenegger and Game of War and things like that. So you watch these ads. That's still, it's expensive to produce those, even though it's easier to get them to the consumer and it's easier to target because what are they doing? Well, you're playing a game, it's targeting you with similar games to the ones that you're playing in terms of an action adventure type game, but it still <coughs> costs money. So it's easier to keep a customer than it is to go prospecting for new customers. You've got to integrate the customer with the producer and make them a part of the team. Really, uh, focus in on what it is that they want. We do mass customization. Dell is a great example of mass customization. What does Dell do? Well, you order a Dell from Dell directly by going online or calling. They customize the product with the processor that you want, the amount of storage that you want, and the software suite that you want. If you don't want all of those things, you don't need all of it on the computer. It's uh, mass customized. Now, to some extent, We've seen a re-intermediation of products, and Dell is one of the ones that's had to re-intermediate because a lot of people want what? When they want to buy a computer, they want to buy it that day, and they don't want to wait two weeks for Dell to mass customize it. So they have re-intermediated. You can buy Dell at places like Best Buy. Do they carry Dell at Walmart? I'm not sure. I know they carry them at Sam's, but I don't have room if they carry them at Walmart. You can buy them at Best Buy, and those are going to be sort of standardized customized products, but we can create customized products in a wide range of things, even as simplistic as M&Ms. So this is an example of value to creation. When I was growing up, M&Ms were this little hard shell candy that came in a cellophane package that was brown. It was something like three ounces of M&M's. That was, that was it. That's all you got. They had red, blue. Well, actually, I don't think they had red when I first started out. They had brown, blue, yellow, and green. And I remember when they added red, it was a big deal. Why was it a big deal when they added red? There was a food coloring called Red Dye Number no. 9 that was used to color stuff in the food industry. And it turns out that that red dye was and so they stopped producing. So it was hard to get red. So they came up with a new red dye, and they they introduced the red. And I can remember that um, it was a big deal when they came out with those the new color of M and M's. Now you can get M and M's in all kinds of colors. They're not just those standard colors. You can get them in pastels. 
you can create your own. So you choose up to three colors. You can add an image. You can choose your creepy picture to put on the M&M. There are lots of couples that are getting married that are buying M&Ms. They're putting their creepy wedding photo on the M&M. It's rather disturbing to me. You can add clip art. You can put in text. And then finally, you no longer have to be limited to those brown cellophane packages. You can get M&Ms in all kinds of different packages. You can get them for your uh, company in a business <coughs> card kit, a gift box, a celebration kind of package for like a sort of wedding, congratulations, candy dishes, mini gumball dispensers, Wedding cake tins, flavor packs, all of that. So this is mass customization um, with ribbons, gold ribbons, yellow ribbons. We're able to do that as a result of highly industrialized, sophisticated processes, right? So we've got a lot more producers. Candy, everything is now highly differentiated. It's not just... Uh, your standard M&M five color in a cellophane pack, you can get it in all kinds of stuff. So we've been in this area of value cooperation. One of the things that we have recognized is that because of this era, consumers are far more sophisticated than they were. And we have become far more conscious than we were in the past of our own behaviors. And so consumers actually want to do businesses with companies that are sustainable and provide good value. So it's become a part of value co-creation to also engage in corporate social responsibility. What are some companies that engage in corporate social responsibility? Well, there are companies that integrate the traditional marketing mix, the four P's, product, price, place, promotion, with an additional three P's that focus on people, planet, and profits. That's what it means to be sustainable now. Focusing on the impact that we have on individuals, making products that are wholesome. So what are they doing with a lot of cereals now to make them more... Uh, artificial colors? They're reducing artificial colors, sweeteners that are high in fat, and, or high in calories, and low in nutritional value. A lot of the cereals are now becoming gluten-free. That's been a big move, particularly with Kellogg's, as we've become sensitive to gluten intolerance. What percentage of the population is actually gluten intolerant? When did this become a thing? It's been know. in the last five years. I, was, I just did we recently. It's less than one one hundredth of a percent of people are actually gluten intolerant. A lot of people go to their doctor and they say, well, maybe you're, you've got some gluten sensitivity, and they put them on a gluten-free diet, and they start to feel better. Why is it that they actually feel better? Yeah, they're eating less junk. If, if, yeah, if you if you take the gluten out of your diet, you'll probably lose weight. But now what we've started to do is we've started to see companies producing junk food that is gluten free. Because there are, are, are substitutes for gluten that you can put in that make it you know just as uh, just as tasty uh, and just as bad for you and it's gluten free. And all kinds of things are now advertising. This is one of the things that I think we ought to think about in terms of corporate social responsibility is are we really misleading consumers or are we playing on consumers perhaps irrational fears with things like advertising products as gluten-free. They now have gluten-free eggs. Eggs were always gluten-free. <laughs> you know, they're now putting it on the gluten-free. Never was an egg that had gluten in it. So I think it's, it's a little disingenuous, but it's recognizing that we have to add three P's to the marketing mix, that we focus on people. Who is it that we are serving? What are we doing in our communities to be good stewards of the resources that we have? Uh, how are we impacting the planet? And of course, recognizing that businesses exist to make a profit. Social entrepreneurship has become important in this, and people actually want to do business. It's good business to do business with businesses that are socially responsible. So Tom's, for example, what is Tom's socially responsible uh, marketing campaign that they're doing? It's one for one. For every pair of shoes that you buy, they do what? They donate a pair of shoes. 
Who else is engaged in social entrepreneurship? Well, Tom's is one. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is another one that engages in social entrepreneurship. Uh, giving away, for example, one of the products that they make is a drug that's used by very few people but is enormously important in, in curing river blindness. And so they, they make that product and continue to give it away, though it, it has absolutely no profit margin. So it's, it, it's a big part. Uh, ben & Jerry's is another one that has been socially uh, responsible. They produce ice cream, they're making a profit, but they also use that profit to benefit what? What has Ben & Jerry's big social promotion? It's been HIV and AIDS research. So it's, a, it's recognizing that with this benefit of the limited liability, comes a responsibility, I think, to be good stewards of our environment. And that includes the economic, social, uh, and, and physical environment as well, while recognizing that we have to make a profit. So any questions about corporate social responsibility or the marketing theories? What did you say that three People, planet, profit. So in addition to the four Ps, product, price, place, promotion, we can add a consideration, and that's really the stakeholder theory, is focusing on what impact we're having on people, not just our customers, but also our constituents in terms of suppliers that we deal with. One of the reasons that Walmart is roundly criticized in that case study that you looked at is, what has Walmart done? They've reversed the flow of power in the distribution channel. Historically, who held the most amount of power in the distribution channel? Well, it was the producer, because the producer at least set what? The initial price. And that price flowed through the channel. Each, each intermediary adding some money to the price in order to make a profit off of it. Walmart reversed that power flow because they were able to go to producers and say what? We're not going to pay that price. We're going to tell you what we think your profit margin should be. And you're going to sell it to us at that price. And there's a great case study you can Google it. It's called The Man Who Said No to Walmart. It's an article. And it talks about snapper mowers. <coughs> snapper, Walmart wanted to sell snapper mowers, but what did Walmart say that their price point is? What do you think of the average mower of sale is at Walmart? What's the average price of a mower at Walmart? $150. It's $100. It's 100 bucks. Snapper wouldn't make a mower for a hundred bucks. So they told Walmart that. Said it was it was enormously difficult because they are the largest retailer of what? They're actually the largest retailer of lawnmowers, textiles, soap, laundry detergent, toothpaste, home products, furniture, and what else? Diamonds. They're, they're an enormously powerful uh, entity. And they reverse the, the power flow uh, in, in the marketing channel. All right, so with that, I will stop for the day. I will pass out the exam. You have Thursday to either work on the exam, your article review, or in your groups. I will be here on Thursday if you want to meet with me about anything. I will open the classroom door and you can text me if you want me to meet with you or you can come to my office and I'll be hanging out in there. You don't want to walk the vast distance across the Sahara over there, known as the green, to my office. You can text me and I'll be happy to come over and meet with you in class, all right?